In the middle of the Third Age, thanks to its powerful navy, Gondor was unchallenged in its domination of the northern coastlines of Middle-earth. But by the end of the Third Age, Gondor's navy barely existed, and the Gondorians could only watch in horror as the Black Fleet of Umbar closed in on their shores. So in this video, let's explore what might have happened to Gondor's navy, and what was it doing during the War of the Ring. As a successor kingdom of Numenor, Gondor inherited strong naval traditions, and unlike its sister kingdom of Arnor, most of its population dwelt on the coast or along significant waterways. During the reign of Siriondil, Gondor's 11th king, Gondor would begin to expand southwards and westwards along the coasts. This expansion was led by Taranon Falaster, captain of the hosts, who would go on to become the 12th king of Gondor in 830 of the Third Age. During Taranon's reign, Gondor was in contact with the Black Numenorean realms to the south, but this diplomacy would end up failing. Aarnil I, Taranon's nephew and successor, would rebuild Pelagir and constructed a large navy with the intention of taking the port city of Umbar, which he did in 933 of the Third Age, extending Gondor's naval dominance far to the south. Three years later, Aarnil I would perish at sea alongside much of his fleet when it was hit by a storm, but his son, Kiriandil would continue building more ships. Kiriandil would not live to see his work completed, and died in battle against the Black Numenorians and Haradrim in 1015. Following Kiriandil's death, Gondor demonstrated just how effective its navy was. Although the Black Numenorians and Haradrim besieged Umbar, they could not take it because Gondor's unchallenged dominance of the seas meant they could keep the city resupplied and reinforced. In the end, the siege would last an astonishing 35 years, until Hjarmendekil I crushed the Haradrim on land in 1050. Hjarmendekil I's victory over the Haradrim would establish Gondor's supremacy over Harad for the next 400 years. Over the next few centuries, Gondor's attention was less focused on the lands to the south. However, Gondor's navy still retained a lot of its power, and in the end, you could make a claim that Gondor's navy had become a monster that could no longer be controlled. In 1432, with the ascension of Eldakar, Civil war broke out in Gondor, with the vast majority of the Gondor's navy siding with the usurper, a man known as Castamir, who was captain of the ships. Eldakar was initially defeated in 1437, and Castamir became king for a time, but when Castamir was defeated and killed in 1447, under the leadership of his sons, Gondor's navy defected and sailed to Umbar. These rebels would seize Umbar, and create a new rebellious realm to the south, Gondor's supremacy over Harad was broken, and its dominance over the seas was now contested. With little navy remaining, the Gondorian loyalists could not take the fight to the rebels, and over the next few centuries, a back and forth war would be fought. King Aldemir would be slain in 1540, and although King Hjarmendekil II would score a major victory in 1551, the rebels would respond with a raid on Pelagir in 1634, which resulted in the death of King Menardil. Minardil's son, Telemnar, started building a fleet to deal with the rebels once and for all, but a mere two years into his reign, the Great Plague struck, killing Telemnar and devastating Gondor. The fleet building was delayed until the reign of Telumitar Umbardikil, which began in 1798. Enraged at the audacity of the rebels to raid Gondor's coasts as far as Anthalas, Telumitar attacked Umbar directly in 1810, seizing it and killing the descendants of Castamir. Umbar would remain in Gondorian hands for the next 40 years, but would fall to the Haradrim sometime after the invasion of the Wainriders. These Haradrim would become known as the Corsairs of Umbar. Despite the loss of Umbar, Gondor maintains a powerful navy until at least the time of Aarnil II. This navy is instrumental in transporting Gondor's army to Ariador to deal with Angmar in 1975, and it's said to have been so large that it was forced to dock not only at the Grey Havens, but also the ports of Forlond and Harlond as well. Yet after this, Gondor's navy almost vanishes from history. This leads people to wonder what happened between the reign of King Aarnil II and Stuart Denethor II. How did Gondor go from having a massive fleet that was strong enough to defeat Umbar, to a fleet that was helpless against the Corsairs during the War of the Ring? What happened to Gondor's navy? Was it destroyed, or did it gradually decline? Although Tolkien doesn't explicitly tell us, this is a topic I'm fairly confident about using the information that Tolkien does tell us. Following Aarnil II is just one more king, Aenor, and after him comes the line of stewards. 
The reign of the first steward, Mardil Voron Wei, coincides with the beginning of the Watchful Peace. This is a near 400 year long period where Gondor is at relative peace, and it can be assumed that Gondor's navy emerged from this period as a powerful force. Or can it? During the time of the Kings of Gondor, there is one major threat that they did not have to deal with. Mordor, and by proxy, Minas Morgul. Although the threat from Rune and Harad shouldn't be downplayed, the simple reality is that Gondor's capitals at Osgiliath and later Minas Tirith were deep in protected territory. The Kings of Gondor could shift their attention when required because they had both the time and resources to do so. If a threat required a navy, they could spend time building it up, safe in the knowledge that they wouldn't suddenly get overwhelmed by some other foe. The Stuarts were not so lucky. They were constantly under threat, and these new threats of Mordor and Minas Morgul were within two days march of the capital at Minas Tirith. This is demonstrated in 2475, only 15 years after the end of the Watchful Peace. A force from Mordor overruns Aphilion and takes off Giliath, putting them within striking distance of Minas Tirith. Although Gondor would manage to retake its lost territory, it was a stark reminder that the stewards did not have the luxury of time when responding to threats nor did they have the luxury of delegating resources generously. The defense of Aphilion and the line of the Anduin would require constant upkeep, because any momentary weakness could see Mordor's forces at the gate of Minas Tirith. So with Gondor so focused on defending its new front line, it wouldn't be surprising if the navy was neglected. After all, at the time, when compared to Mordor, the Easterlings and the Haradrim, the Corsairs were seen as the least threatening, Despite their ability to strike along all of Gondor's coastlines, for all their intents and purposes, the Corsairs of Umbar were just raiders. Pirates. They could make life miserable for coastal dwellers, they could kill, cause economic damage, but they were not an existential threat to Gondor's existence. At least, not yet. It's also worth mentioning that, historically, Gondor had always used its navy offensively. During the time of the stewards, Gondor largely adopted a defensive doctrine, meaning Gondor's navy would be relegated to patrolling the hundreds of miles of Gondorian coastline. The question could be raised, just how effective was this at stopping Corsair raids? After all, the Corsairs were pirates, they were looking to pillage and plunder, not engage the Gondorian military directly. If Corsair raids were constantly slipping through the cracks, which they would have, it would heighten the perception that the Gondorian navy was simply not as effective, and that perhaps the Corsairs would be better combated by having coastal garrisons that would be ready to meet them. It's quite likely that in the centuries that followed the Watchful Peace, the Gondorian navy was simply a victim of attrition due to forced negligence. Ships would be lost, whether in combat or due to weather or poor maintenance, and they would not be replaced at the same rate due to Gondor's increasing need for men and resources on its other frontiers. Meanwhile, the Corsairs, with their sole purpose and seemingly safe stronghold, would easily be able to replace lost ships and sailors and direct them straight back at Gondor. Over time, the balance of power would shift, and the more it favoured the Corsairs, the more destructive it would be for Gondor's navy. This is demonstrated in 2758, where the Corsairs launch three massive fleets against Gondor, and also Rohan, for the purposes of invasion. It's possible that in this conflict, after being gradually weakened for centuries, Gondor's navy is utterly crushed, or rendered useless, giving the Corsairs free roam of the sea. However, this conflict also demonstrates a weakness of the Corsairs. They're raiders, not a land army, and they were beaten badly by Beragond, the son of Stuart Beren. By this point in time, it seems almost certain that Gondor's navy had been mostly destroyed, or at least significantly reduced, but we know that it still existed through to the War of the Ring. One of the most spectacular achievements of Gondor's navy came during the time of Stuart Ecthelion II, around the year of 2979. With his permission, a man named Thorongil gathered a small fleet, and sailed in secret to Umbar. There, they launched a daring nighttime raid, burned much of the Corsair fleet at Anchor, and withdrew with little loss. Thorongil, who was actually Aragorn, the future King Alessar, personally slew Umbar's Captain of the Haven. During the War of the Ring, Gondor's navy is referred to once, in a relatively throwaway line. When soldiers from Gondor's fiefdoms are arriving in Minas Tirith, it's mentioned that it includes 100 men from the Ethir Anduin, those who could be spared from the ships. However, the actions of the Gondorian navy during the War of the Ring are completely unknown. It's possible they attempted to defend the Ethir Anduin or perhaps Pelagir itself. 
Either way, they would have been destroyed by the Corsairs. Another alternative is that they retreated westwards to Lin Heer or Dol Amroth, from where they might have survived the war. After the War of the Ring, it's likely Gondor became a major naval power once again. They would have had a head start from the spoils of war. The ships they captured from the Corsairs at Pelagir, which included as many as 50 larger ships and dozens of other smaller vessels. In Tolkien's unfinished New Shadow book, the protagonist, Borlas, mentions that his son, Baralak, had a high position in the King's Navy, and was often at sea for extended periods of time. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it or at least found it interesting. If you want more videos about Gondor's Navy, you're out of luck because I don't think I could make another video about Gondor's Navy to be honest. Thank you to all my subscribers, supporters and patrons. Cheers, farewell and remember, there are 8 landlocked nations that have a navy. I don't know what you'll do with that information, but I hope it helps somewhere.